all the birthdays. Did we miss anybody? I'm sure, well, hopefully in the next few weeks we'll have a sheet out so that if you would like to have your name and um, birthday put up, we will make sure that you join the illustrious cast of people every month that have their mug shops up on the screen. Mind you, they are not live stream, so nobody else gets to see them except us. So if you would like to be on the mugshot, then please um, fill out the forms when we have it so that we can share in your milestone birthdays and anniversaries. As we come to the Lord's table, we're going to turn to number five in our hymn books as we just sing the first verse and chorus of Jesus Paid It All. Number five in the hymn book. As we come to the table, let's just bow in reflection as we look upon Calvary, as we give thanks to the Lord for all he's done and doing in our lives. Our Father, we thank you for the privileged position we have as your children to come before your throne once again. As we reflect upon Calvary, our Father, we're reminded of the cost of this gift of salvation it was a price that had to be paid it was a price that we couldn't pay we had a debt of sin that had accumulated and yet a payment was required and the only one that could do that was your son the lord jesus christ and we thank you for the shedding of that blood that covers over our sins past present and future and we pray that we might never forget the price that was paid to pay the debt that we owed and so father we thank you once again as we're reminded of this as we come to the lord's table and we give you thanks now in jesus precious name amen as the elements are distributed let's retain them to partake as one together The scriptures remind us of these words but I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you the Lord Jesus on the night in which he's betrayed took bread 
And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Our Father, we thank you for the reminder once again of this gift of salvation to understand that we exchange our own rags of righteousness for your righteousness that we are covered in that robe of righteousness which Jesus gives to us by faith we know that our Heavenly Father sees that robe of righteousness and accepts us as his own and we thank you that we're challenged to live a life that indeed reflects that relationship that we have, that we pray each day we strive to be more like you and we know the transformation is taking place and one day it will be complete. But till then we pray that people might see that indeed our lives reflect the one whom we follow the Lord Jesus Christ and we give you all the glory now in Jesus name amen I'd ask that the glasses be sent to the end for collection as we sing the remaining stanzas of number five Tonight we're going to turn in our Bibles to Titus chapter 2 and we're looking at part 2 of our uh, thing of predators in the pulpit. We didn't get very far last week, just a couple of verses, but we looked at that part of, I think I just started on it, of a depraved mindset where Paul in these verses is showing us the character and the conduct of these people and what makes them do what they do and 
as we break it down tonight, we find the first thing is what I call the disposition in verses 12, 13a. Every one of their own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil animals, lazy people who did nothing but eat. The words that the prophet said are true. Now that's quite a statement. And um, what Paul does here, he cites one of their own, if you like, um, prophets as evidence to substantiate their character and their reputation. They were known for this throughout the world at their time. And a well-known um, commentator gives us information about who this prophet is. Does anyone know who this prophet was? No, he's not a prophet of God that made this quote. But this well-known commentator said his name was Epimendis. And he was a famous, um, well, the most revered um, prophet in all of Crete. He was a poet. He was a teacher. He was a writer. And he was also a pagan to boot. So just a, a bit of information about it. He was born in the 6th century in the city of Knossos on the Isle of Crete. And he was ranked as one of the seven wisest men in Greece. So he, he was a gifted person with his intellect. He could speak very well and he was a hero. And this is the comment that he made. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That was his words. The Cretans, he said are chronic liars. They had given testimony to the world about their ability to lie in lots of ways. This commentator goes on to say one of the most famous ones, lies that they told, was they prided themselves on having on the Isle of Crete the tomb of Zeus. And you might be saying, well, what's wrong with that? Well, Zeus was a deity who couldn't die. So if he couldn't die, what's the point in having a tomb? They also claimed that Zeus was in it. The greatest of gods, according to their mythology, couldn't die. And so they couldn't. He couldn't be buried in a tomb. So it was a classic example of their ability to lie about things. They lived up to their bad reputation. They became notorious liars, cheaters, gluttons and traitors. And these false teachers, he's saying, it's not really surprising because that's what life's like on the Isle of Crete. They're perfect examples of the worst type of people living there. He says, Cretans are always liars, was his statement. And you know what Paul says? The prophet was right. He got it right when he said that about these people. Now, that says a wonderful reputation about this isle. Because, you know, sometimes we say, oh, where are you from? You know, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, whatever. And we say, oh, that says a lot about you. You're a Queenslander or you're, a, you're this. Our favourite thing for a Queenslander was you're a banana bender. But if you said, I come from Crete, guess what you were thinking straight away? I wouldn't trust these people as far as I could kick them because they lie. That's what their reputation. Anyone who came from Crete, liar. So what a reputation to have. You know, you would be almost ashamed to say, oh, I come from Crete. <laughs> well, really? I don't want to know you. And the word used here in the original is a word that means to lie. It was a way of life that everybody accepted in the Isle of Crete and what they were known for. Not very flattering reputation to be known as a liar. 
Now let me say that not everyone in Crete adopted this, well, lifestyle behaviour, but it was accepted by most of the population as being the cultural thing to do. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to know when it came to the things of God, what do you think they did with them? They lied about them, the truth. There's an expression, they wouldn't know the truth if it hit him in the face. So bad was their lying, they couldn't tell the difference between a lie and the truth if they wanted to. Their own prophet, well known, wasn't very flattering when he described the type of people they were. Not only were they liars, but he presents the image of people who allowed themselves to overindulge. People who were obese, had an aversion to hard work, or for that matter, work of any kind that required effort. They were people who were controlled by their lusts and appetites, and they gave them free reign. Now that says a lot about that society. In the original language, it describes them as slow bellies. That's the idea, slow bellies. They have big bellies that go slow. And so he's picturing them, these types of predators were stalking and hanging around the church, waiting for an opportunity to spread their lies to anyone who would listen for a price. And Paul is saying, I'm not being mean to these people, I'm just saying, as one of their own have said, and believe you me, he's right on the money with his assessment that he makes of them. Now, their own prophet said this about his people in the 6th century, but the reality is, here in Paul's day, some five to 600 years later, the truth was still there. Five or 600 years later, what he said was true of people today. So there'd been no significant change in their cultural understanding of truth. They still continued to lie as a way of life. Now think about what had just been revealed about these people in Crete, and in it comes Titus. He's dropped right in the middle of it, and what's he expected to do with people who make lying a way of life? Paul says, you've got to change this, mate. This is your job. You've got to change the culture. You can't let them get away with that. Now, if I was Titus, well, hang on a minute. You're asking an awful lot. It's a difficult task to change something that's remained unchanged for so long. You know, people don't like change. I can remember when I first came here, about things that we wanted to have done. Oh, we can't do that. We've never done it that way. We're happy the way things are. And um, I think it wasn't that long ago when we decided to have air conditioning here. People said, no, we don't need air conditioning. We've done it without it for this long. And now, if the air conditioners are not on, why aren't they working? It's something about human nature that doesn't like change immediately um, and yet the benefits are there but the prospect that Titus would have had of trying to change a culture that it was a way of life how was he going to do it and Paul called it for what it was truth hurts because people don't like to be told this is what you are this is what needs to be changed. And as Christians, these are the things we must do. Expose the character and nature of sin of mankind. We have the tendency to want to do the wrong things rather than pursue the right things. Then he says in the next part of the verse, in 13b, so firmly tell these people they are wrong. Simple thing. Titus is told to confront them, to disagree with their teachings, reprove them, tell them they're wrong and expose their error for all to see. Now, what's the point of doing this? And what Paul, he's thinking is, if these people are corrected, there's just the chance that they might change 
and repent and we can turn the culture around. And that was what his idea was. Now, to do that, if you want to stay on side of the good side of people, you don't go in all guns blazing and say, hey, you mob, you're a pack of liars and you need to change now and we're going to change you. What sort of response do you think that would get? Would you suggest that there might be some sort of resistance? I would say there's probably many people who would there in Crete, if you told them that, that approach, um, they, would not be very, they would be offended, you would think that of them. It might be true, but to actually say it in public, they would be deeply offended and they would resist any idea of change. So Paul's idea was not to go in there with all guns blazing, not to damn them to hell, but to go about the business of getting alongside them with the idea of rescuing them from their error. Don't ignore them. Don't just hope that they'll go away of their own accord. But he says, Titus, you rebuke them severely and keep on doing it until there is a change. And the Greek word that's used here is apotmos, and that's an interesting word. Now, it would mean that if I had a hand that was gangrene, what should I do with it? What would the recommendations be for me to do with my hand? Now, what if I just took a bread and butter knife and just sliced it? Would that be effective? Why not? Because it wouldn't deal with the problem. And so the idea of this word, it means to cut off with a knife or an axe, sever it. So it would be saying, with that hand, use it like an axe to cut off a limb. You be very severe with it. You give it one almighty chop and it's gone. That's how you bring about change. And that's what he's saying here. I want you to cut off a branch. And what Paul is saying is, he's not saying, look, run around like a mad axeman cutting people you know, off with your axe, cutting their limbs off. What he's suggesting to Titus is, cut off their opportunities. Their opportunities to speak and spread their false information. You pull the rug out from under them and keep them silent. Starve them of any opportunities they may have to use a platform to reach the public with their views, opinions and teachings. Now that's a lot to ask. Titus, your job is to straighten the churches out. Your job is to help them walk the right path. And that means standing up for the truth and confronting sin when you found it. Now Titus had to be aware of what was happening around him. He was in the front line of it, engaging with an enemy that was ruthless and relentless in his efforts. And so he couldn't afford to be distracted from the purpose for which he was there. Now that's a challenge from the modern church today. And particularly those who are in leadership positions, sin must be confronted and dealt with. No matter who the person is, if they are to have an effective ministry and witness in the community. Sin must be confronted and dealt with. It must be severely cut off before it infects the rest of the church. Now rebuking a person for sin is not something that leaders look forward to doing. But if they're going to stand up for the truth, they simply cannot overlook or sweep sin under the carpet and say, oh, it's never happened. Well, there would be some opposition from members. It's the pastor's responsibility to rebuke members who failed to live up to Christian standards. So Paul set the scene here with it, you know. Firmly tell those people they're doing the wrong thing. Don't be distracted. Don't be put off. Don't bury your head in the sand. This is your responsibility. And the difference, 
so they may become strong in the faith, not accepting Jewish false stories and the commands of people to reject the truth. So Paul has given Titus a mandate to cut off the dead wood, so to speak, so the church can grow healthy and be strong. To do that, it means exposing error that are being taught by those peddling a different gospel message in order to snare believers who are confused. And it seems from our text that there were some of these predators working to promote Jewish myths, making up whatever commandments that came into their minds at the time. And the instruction is simple. Don't pay attention to those who peddle this rubbish. Don't listen to anything they have to say. Reject it and turn away from it. Now we already know from verse 10 there are those who are peddling the Jewish rite of circumcision. And what they were saying is, hey, it's all right that you've required, you've got this gift of salvation, but, you know, as another requirement salvation, um, they're saying you must add circumcision to it. If you really are saved, if you really are a Christian, then you've got to add circumcision to it to be complete and this is something that's always ongoing and this group of Jewish believers had turned away from the truth and to turn away from the truth means this group of people no longer uses or believes that the Bible is the sole authority for truth and living they believe in using their own life experiences their own opinions and dreams as a form of greater mystical knowledge here in Crete this group of men were promoting Jewish myths and the commandments of men regarding Jewish myths they would come up with some weird and wonderful ways in which to interpret the Old Testament truth that was based on superstitions and their own imaginations and the reason they did this they believed they had access to a higher knowledge and understanding of these spiritual truths more than anybody else and so if you like if you wanted to be part of this elite group then you had to understand these secret teachings and experiences for a price and you would become part of this greater knowledge in Paul's day it was what was called Gnosticism and it ran amok among churches and many people were conned into believing that it was possible for an ordinary human being to have a mystical experience with one of the gods who would give you this greater knowledge and understanding about spiritual things than anybody else as a result you became a master of this knowledge it gave you insights into the secret meanings behind the text and if you wanted to know this, you would pay for it because it wasn't free. You might say, well, pastor, that's all well and good. That was in those times. But you know what? Today, more than ever, we're seeing the same sort of truth being promoted. The push or revival in our day is looking for the same thing. It's looking to have a meaningful experience if you like a mystical experience where you can come into the presence of God and you can see and feel things you've never experienced and this experience makes you superior to anybody else and you'll accept no one else's authority on these matters because of your spiritual experience today we have more people believing in their experiences than they do the authority of the Word of God and this is dangerous it's the same sort of thing that's here and when you say to them well do you believe that the Word of God is your authority and teaches you how to live and that's the end of it no my experience is superior to that and that then becomes their authority because they've had some sort of mystical experience that trumps the Word of God we have that today and we have many people say look I had a dream I had a vision and God told me to do this and so it is superior 
to the Word of God. Well, I've got news for you. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. This is something that's been around for a long time. It's just given a new coat of paint and called something different. But it's still the same as what I experienced in the church before. And I often hear people, I want to experience God. I want to feel God. I want to be lifted up to the plains. And when they have that experience, oh, I want that experience again and again and again. Well, in many places, in many ways, you've been conned. You have been conned. Because the Word of God is what gives you the teaching and satisfies you about who you are and your identity in Christ. And no mystical experience is going to replace the truth of the Word of God. And many people continue to look for that experience week after week after week because they're not satisfied with what they have already. The second thing in our text is that these men required that you follow their rules and commandments that they gave you if you wanted God to continue to accept you in that way. So what they're saying is, hey, it's easy. All you have to do is do as we say. Meet the conditions, follow the rules, and um, don't question them, and we'll give you the secret knowledge and understanding of what the God's required if you want to please them. So if you had an experience and you paid for this experience, you gained this knowledge and the gods would, if you like, connect with you. And that made you superior to any other authority. Now, when we make up rules and we impose them, what's the word we use if we force others to follow those rules? What do we call it? It's a wonderful word. It's called legalism. Legalism. You follow and do all the outward things if you want to keep God happy is what they're saying. Conform by doing the outward things that would please God. In other words, work for your salvation And there's nothing new under the sun. It continues today in one form or another. And I'm amazed at how many Christians believe they have to continue working for their salvation, working to please God in order to be accepted because they don't understand that salvation is a gift that's given to them by faith in Christ and his finished work. It's a gift. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. You don't merit it. It's given as a gift. And many Christians confuse salvation with sanctification. Sanctification is the part where we uh, are working in cooperation with God and the Holy Spirit to become transformed every day. And that's, we do this in order to please God. Not to be accepted by God because that's already happened. But to maintain a godly walk with the Lord. There is a difference. Paul says, reject this type of teaching. Cut it off. Don't give it a platform. Don't allow it to breathe. Silence it before it can do damage to a healthy and growing church. Very clear. Then he talks about a defiled morality. To those who are pure, all things are pure. But to those who are full of sin... And do not believe nothing is pure. Both their minds and their consciences have been ruined. They say they know God, but their actions show they do not accept him. They are hateful people. They refuse to obey. They are useless for doing anything good. Wow. In a nutshell, Paul is saying these predators are promoting a different gospel to the one presented in the scriptures and according to the teachings of the apostles. These predators never practice what they preach. They're always on the lookout for new prey to fleece to take advantage of with their myths and teachings. And they have no conscience about doing such things and it's proved by their own actions and lifestyles. 
They don't have any understanding or knowledge of who God is and what he wants. He does talk about the dedicated to those who are pure. All things are pure. Now Paul understands that not the whole population of Crete accepted philosophies and practices that were being taught. He knew there was a faithful remnant that had remained faithful and steadfast in the church and their lives were demonstrating this truth of what a godly life was all about. They lived what they believed every day. They were consistent in promoting that message throughout their community. So Paul says there's a faithful remnant who are doing the opposite of what majority of the population are doing. They're a dedicated group. They were living for the Lord. The distraction, but to those who are full of sin and do not believe, nothing is pure, but their minds and their consciences have been ruined. So on one hand, you had a group, a faithful group, who was doing the right thing, keeping themselves pure, but to the majority, Paul said, there were many who professed to be Christians who were living and practicing the opposite of what the scriptures taught regarding a godly life. So one group was doing it, but the majority were not doing it. Many were distracted and confused by the teaching of these false prophets who taught that if you wanted to be pure, if you wanted to please God, then you had to keep the law. You had to keep all the traditions, all the practices regarding food and everything else in life, and this somehow would make you pure on the inside. Wow, isn't that lovely? If I ate all the pizza and all the KFC and drank all the Coke in the world, on the inside, it would make me pure. I should take this to my doctor because he says, ah, 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 what you put in affects what's inside. And all that will not make me pure might make me feel good for a little while but you know it's going to affect me in the wrong way but what they're saying is it doesn't matter outward it's what you put in that makes you pure if you didn't touch anything that was considered impure if you didn't do anything that was forbidden or off limits then all these things would make you pure The thinking presented here is if you violated any of these instructions, in other words, if you failed to carry them out, then you defiled yourself, then you would become defiled or unacceptable to God because of your inability to keep and maintain the requirements. It's promoting that it is what you do outside the body that makes the body pure on the inside and therefore acceptable to God. You might be thinking, Pastor, you've got to be crazy to think like that. Would people do that? Well, yeah. This is what organized religion and traditions do. If I do this, if I follow what I'm told, I'll be okay. Now, let me demonstrate that. If I go to church, I light a candle, I say all the prayers. If I kneel, if I go to confession, if I use the beads, if I give my money to the church then all these good deeds will outweigh all my bad deeds and I'll be pure and acceptable to God. That's all outward things. All these outward things do not change what's in me. The same as all the Coke, all the pizza, all the KFC, all that stuff is not going to make me pure. I've taken it from the outside. It's going to rot my insides. It's not going to make me pure. But many people think it does. Now, I'm not against those things, mind you. If you want them, eat them. All I'm saying is that by eating them, they're not going to make you pure within. And what Paul is saying, wake up to yourselves. How do you think this is possible, let alone acceptable to God? If you think like this, I've got a news flash. And you're not going to like what I have to say. Paul is saying that if the inside is defiled and dirty, then no amount of outside things you do is going to change what's inside you. 
That's the truth. He says, of all these false teachers of Crete, they had defiled their minds and their conscience to show how bad things really were. And the mind is referring to the intellect. Their conscience is referring to the faculties they used to think. Their mind, their thoughts, their desires and purposes are defiled. And if this is the case, whatever they present as truth, it's up the creek as well. It cannot be trusted because it is impure. Their conscience is affected to the point where it cannot choose between what is right and wrong. In other words, Paul is saying you cannot trust the thing they say because their mind cannot conceive truth and their conscience is so bad they cannot make right decisions or choices because they are so defiled and corrupt. Meaning that whatever they touch, whoever they touch, will also become defiled by them. Powerful words. So be aware of predators in the pulpit who say, look, you must experience these dreams, these revelations, these mystical experiences that they will open you up to a greater spiritual knowledge than you've ever had before and you really come to know and love God in a way you never thought possible. What Paul says, don't believe it. Don't believe it. In other words, do what I say and this can be your experience as well and you'll be pure. You'll find acceptance with God. Trust me, they'll say, I know these things. I can speak with authority that is true. Paul says wrong thinking, wrong teaching. You must come to know Christ in the first place. You must see yourself as God sees you as a sinner that is condemned to death for sin. And you'll see that Jesus Christ came to be your substitute. He paid the penalty for your sin that was required and as a result he offers forgiveness for those sins. Jesus Christ washes you clean from the inside out. He puts it under the blood of the cross. cross. He washes away all sin, past, present and future. You see, Jesus Christ does the cleansing from the inside out. We don't do it from the outside in to make us acceptable. So be careful, he says, don't listen. And finally, the defilement. They say they know God, but their actions show they do not accept him. They are hateful people, they refuse to obey, and they are useless for doing anything good. What Paul is saying and what this picture says, your actions speak louder than what you say. And that's why it's, con it's important that Christians, we practice what we preach. We're consistent. Our message and our walk are the same in a consistent way. And Paul says, look, don't just believe me. Just have a look at what they say and then look at how they live. This will reveal what they're like. Their words and works will give them away. They're fraudsters. They will use and manipulate people to obtain what they want. They claim to know. They claim to be Christian. They claim to know God through mystical experiences and knowledge. They allow themselves to be puffed up about this greater knowledge and what you must do to be acceptable to God. They say, follow us and our teachings. We have this greater knowledge and understanding and if you do what we say, you'll be fine. Paul says, look at what they do. It will show you what they are really like. They live in denial of the truth and what the truth demands of true followers of Christ. And so it's very clear what Paul's instructions are to Timothy. Silence them. Pull the rug out from under them expose them for what they are reprove them and you know as we look at the Isle of Crete this is where Titus is called to minister not an easy situation yet these people needed the gospel like nobody else and so Paul sought to prepare Titus for the challenges he would face prepare him to have an effective ministry and the world in which we live shares many similarities with Crete. And we must be aware of these challenges. But we also must be willing to embrace the work 
we've been called upon to do. Time is short. I don't, I don't believe the Lord's return is very far away. And the time that we have is short. And we might not have many more opportunities to have the freedom to express the good news to people. And so we need to take the opportunities while we have 